my Let's Play, I have uh, making my way through Mass Effect 3, and I had previously played Mass Effect 2. And, well, I'm thinking about Bioware franchises, and the fact that I previously reviewed Dragon Age 2 after a abortive attempt at a Let's Play, I figure I might as well give my thoughts on the most recent installment of the Dragon Age series, Dragon Age Inquisition. Now, narratively, Dragon Age Inquisition is where all your chickens come home to roost from the consequences of all this, of not all the decisions you made in the first two games, but, a, but some of them. So, consequently, this video will have some spoilers for Dragon Age 1 and 2. Previously, in the Dragon Age series, a war has broken out between the mages of Thetis and the Templars of Thetis, the Templars being those whose role was to keep the mages in check through, if necessary, they're deciding necessary, not the mages deciding is necessary, mass murder of mages. The sentiments behind this war had been brewing for years, the mages not liking being cooped up in their circle towers, and also kind of resenting the whole the Templars can murder us all at any time thing, but it had been brought to the forefront now by three factors. The first was Anders, a mage who was first introduced in the big DLC pack for Dragon Age Origin Origins, Dragon Age Awakening. Anders was basically frequently on the run from the maid circle where he'd been forced to live. He did not do well with confinement. After the protagonist of Dragon Age Origins recruited him into the Grey Wardens, he became bonded to a free spirit called Justice. Free spirits, by quick explanation, are... Well, spirits from the Fade, sort of like the Astral Plane, they usually are related to an emotion or concept. This one's called just called Justice. However, Anders' bitterness and resentment over the plight mages had faced had caused Justice to become warped and distorted into a spirit of vengeance. This was aggravated by the new Knight Commander of the Templar Garrison in the city of Kirkwall, where Dragon Age 2 takes place, and where Anders ended up. Knight Commander Meredith, leader of the garrison, had a very harsh and dim view of the mages in her city, and this, combined with the influx of refugees fleeing the blight from the first game, these refugees including Hawk, Dragon Age 2's protagonist, and Anders' ideological views would have already led to an inevitable conflict. This was aggravated by the discovery of Red Lyrium by an expedition to the Deep Roads commissioned by Bartrand Tethris and his brother Varric, who is one of our party members in Dragon Age 2 and in Dragon Age Inquisition. And this expedition led by the two of them and Hawk, again the protagonist, of Dragon Age 2. After discovering an idol made with Red Lyrium, Bartrand betrayed Varric and Hoth, Hawk, fleeing both the Deep Roads deep road with the idol and leaving the rest of his party behind. Bartrand later sold the idol to Meredith, but the damage to to Bartrand's psyche was done. The red lyrium in the idol drove Bartrand mad. A quick primer about lyrium. It is a crystal, at least depicted as a crystal, in the Dragon Age universe that fuels magic. If normal humans, those who are not magically sensitive, handle unprocessed lyrium, it can drive them mad. Dwarves and mages are the only people who can handle it safely, and Templars take a refined and specifically processed form of lyrium to make them resistant to magic and help them fight mages if necessary, though lyrium is highly addictive for them. So if red lyrium can drive a dwarf mad, it had an even more pronounced effect on Knight Commander Meredith, making her even more paranoid, causing her, causing her to order her Templars to engage in purges of the city's mages branding them in massive numbers tranquil, which is a process basically like magical lobotomization. When the city's chancery refused to side against Meredith, Anders blew it up, kicking off the whole Civil War thing. Ultimately, Meredith was turned into a crystal monster thing by the Red Lyrium and was slain by a combined group of mages and Templars led by Hawk and his companions. However, the damage was done, and a Mage versus Templar Civil War had been launched all over Thetis. Also, if you got the DLC for Dragon Age 2, you were introduced to Corypheus, who is believed to be the first Darkspawn. Hawk and his their party fought Corypheus, and though you defeated him there, Corypheus escaped by possessing one of the characters who you didn't kill in the DLC's big dungeon. This leads to the start of Inquisition. 
After years of conflict, the mages and Templars have been brought together to peace talks by the Divine, the sort of Pope of the, Chant of the Chantry, the religion of Thetis. It seems at long last this war will be over, they will sit down at the table, they will hash out their differences and come to a compromise that will bring peace to the world. Yeah, no. Instead, an explosion racks the meeting, killing the Divine and almost everyone attending, with your player character, who is later known as the Inquisitor, surviving. Further, the scene of the explosion is a big-ass magical rift over it, which in turn is spawning other magical rifts, smaller ones, across multiple countries. This rift is bringing the Fade, the spirit world, the astral plane, as I explained earlier, and the real world together, causing demons of various varieties to be just churned out of them, threatening the entire world as a whole. The party has to put together an army, the Inquisition, to fend off the forces emerging from the rift and stop whatever faction that ends up being taken over by Corypheus, who is the leader of this and is ultimately revealed to be the person responsible, or at least taking responsibility for it, either the Templar or the Mages. This is where we start getting into some real meaningful choices. Choosing to side with the Templar or the Mages closes off an entire quest line from the game, and additional choices will reflect what quest options will be available to you, as well as what allies and resources you have. This will also refl reflect the opponents that will face you in the world, and how your fellow party members will react to you. Siding with the Mages will have an entirely different reaction from your other player characters, or party members, than if you were to side for the Templars. Further, if you've been playing through the whole series... Decisions you've made going back to Dragon Age 1 will have Inquisition repercussions in this game, ranging from Morgan's child, and who, her, who the child's father is, to whom the leader of the Wardens is, related to those quests, in addition to appearances also by having Hawk show up in the game and you getting a letter from the protagonist of Dragon Age 1, and for that matter, whether there's a potential side quest involving one of your party members, or several of your party members from Dragon Age Origins. Also, for that matter, who the ruler of a couple of countries are. Mechanically, the game has also changed a bunch. Dragon Age Origins had a combat system modeled after the system from the old Infinity Engine games, not using the actual Dungeons & Dragons rules, but using a sort of top-down-ish perspective on the PC perspective, though going a little more behind the back with a sort of hybrid action view on consoles. But still something somewhat influenced by the... Star Wars The Old Republic games. Dragon Age 2 basically kept the same engine, but tweaked how combat controlled to make things significantly more action-based. From a magic and healing standpoint, you could carry an almost unlimited amount of healing and mana potions, with mages being able to specialize in healing or combat magic, allowing, or in some cases both, depending on how high you leveled up, allowing your mages to be glass cannons or heal bot 3000s. Further, while you can hotkey a handful of spells to your face buttons, whether the, the main four or the main four in combination with the trigger, you could access any spell you knew through submenus in combat. It would slow down the process of combat, but you could do it, thus allowing in a pinch any caster to be a drack of all trades. In Dragon Age Inquisition, on the other hand, the game keeps the combat mode, but provides a strategic view on consoles, allows you to slide into that and take a more strategic, slower-paced perspective on events with just a push of a button, allowing you to micromanage your party members' actions with time to think and plan out your moves. However, the magic system and the healing system has also been heavily tweaked as part of this. You can only equip a handful or so of spells, and those are the only spells you can cast in combat, so you have to think very strategically in terms of your spell loadout. You can't just have access to every spell you have. If you want to swap out your spells, you only can do that outside of combat. In terms of healing, you have a limited number of healing items and potions that you carry with you. At campsites, which we'll get to in a bit, you can replenish your healing items to full, and it's easy to get to them since the campsites are your fast travel points, and you can also craft additional items to replenish stamina, magic, or provide grenades or regenerative abilities, but you only have a limited number of those. You can't, like, quickly whip up like 99 healing potions or buy 99 healing potions and truck around with those so you have a massive amount of healing available for big boss fights. Similarly, the way healing magic works has also been changed. There is no single person healing spell. There's nothing like a cure light wounds or cure serious or what have you like there was in the earlier Dragon Age games. Instead, healing magic is much more focused on buffs, a certain degree of regeneration, and raise spells 
or revive spells, which also regenerate some hit points when they revive, and that's about as much as it goes. Speaking of which, the world of Dragon Age Inquisition is much larger than in previous games, with bigger world maps to explore spread across a much wider person of Thetis. Portion of Thetis. Consequently, the game incorporates various methods to speed travel along, with the inclusion of mounts in this game, as well as campsites as fast travel points. Because campsites also let you, as mentioned earlier, refill your stocks of potions and change your loadout for support items, they also serve as important points in your explorations. Finding all the campsites allows you to more easily make your way around the map and to more quickly backtrack later if needed, and also, for that matter, more easily swap out party members when you need to in order to change who you have in your party for a particular encounter or fight against a dragon or that sort of thing. Your party members are something of a mixed bag. I like most of the available party members, particularly Varric, who returns from Dragon Age 2, the Iron Bull, a big, boisterous Quinari fighter, and Dorian, a magister from the Deventer Imperium who is also a gay man. These three were my main party with most of the game, this game with Solus, a elven sorcerer who knows more about what's going on than he's telling, and Cassandra, a member of a Seek organization called the Seekers, who is a sword and board fighter as opposed to a big freaking two-handed weapon fighter, like Iron Bull, occasionally being swapped in as well. However, the character I disliked the most, and the one who I resented kind of somewhat having to use, was Sarah, a city elf rogue and archer. The character is written as a mischievous, gives-no-fucks rogue, but instead, she comes across like the person in middle school and high school who found every aspect of school boring, didn't care about cat class, thought everyone, and then went from this into thinking everyone in class who was actually trying to pay attention was stupid, and thus would at not only actively try to disrupt class and make it so no one could learn anything, wasting everyone's time, but also would bully people who were actually interested in learning and didn't appreciate this behavior. This led to a problem for me, because there are only two archers, aside from the Inquisitor, depending on your build, that you can have in the party. There's Varric, and there's Sarah. The problem is Varric's weapon selection is limited to Bianca and upgrades to Bianca, which, if you're familiar with Dragon Age 2, you may get and make sense. The problem being that the bows that you find in the world outpace Bianca significantly, but about by the halfway mark of the game. Thus, if I wanted a ranged combatant who wasn't limited by magic to provide support, and I wanted to be combat effective, I was stuck with Sarah. And I was you know, stuck with Sarah talking about how stupid learning about this historical stuff was, even when we're learning information that is clear that is directly relevant to events that are going on, and if we don't learn this, it potentially could cause us significant problems down the road, and it provides us information that would help us fight our enemy. It made things really frustrating, incredibly frustrating. If there was a way, based on the dialogues options you made, where you could potentially have Sarah maintain her keep-no-fucks attitude, but understand that history matters and history is important, and what we were dealing with here is actually re relevant to historical facts and things that happened in the past, I'd appreciate this more. But that never happened. And it just made driving me up the wall. Now, if you want a close-in rogue, aside from, well, you, you only have one option, Cole. Now, I like Cole as a character. He's a great character art that I'm not going to spoil, but if you don't like him, you're kind of SOL, which is kind of the problem with a certain degree of the, the character lineup. And I understand that there are limitations in terms of you have to write all these characters, you have to voice act all these characters, and all these characters have their own very well generally put together narrative story arcs, but, frankly... Provides a certain degree of limitation where if you have a if you need a particular NPC for your playstyle, if that NPC is a if your your party member that you have is a character you don't like and there's no one else that in the party that will fill that niche, you're kind of screwed. You're kind of forced to play with a character that you don't like that makes the experience to a certain degree unfun by their presence and their quips and one-liners and how they react to story events and that sort of thing. 
In all, Dragon Age Inquisition does a great job of bringing together the plot threads from the first two games, and I'm interested in contrasting this game with Mass Effect 3, as I loved Dragon Age Inquisition. I played all of the DLC. I didn't get all the achievements, but I did a large number, if not quite all, of the side quests for my path. And I'm really enjoying Mass Effect 3 thus far, as far as I've gotten on the Let's Play. That said, it is so tied with the fundamentals of the world, Inquisition that is, particularly in terms of its story, that I'm not sure if I should recommend this game if you haven't played the first two games. It is certainly a game that would be fun if you hadn't played the first two, but you get so much more out of it if you've played those first two games, and you get to see your choices carried across the whole series, that whether or not you choose to play this game on its own, I almost recommend more playing the first two games prior to playing Inquisition. This does lead to a bit of a hiccup where Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2 are not yet backwards compatible on Xbox One, and as of this recording, Dragon Age Origins and Dragon Age 2 are not available on PlayStation Now. So, yeah. Um, kind of situation where if you're going to play the first two games, play them on the. You're kind of stuck playing them on the PC if you're on current consoles. If you have an X PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360, you're good to go. They're both available there on those two platforms. But this series is absolutely worth your time and absolutely worth your money, both for the games themselves and for their DLC, so definitely check those out. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribing gets you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see it or view previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you to mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.